All right, so uh, part three of what is rapidly turning into an overwritten series, but you know, that's how I do it. Uh, last time I talked about the topic of muscular failure, <clears throat> looking specifically at weight room issues. Um, mainly looked at some general concepts, defining concentric, isometric, eccentric muscle actions, failure, focusing on concentric failure, talked about the sticking point, how that will generally be where failure occurs in the sense that that's where the maximum force is required. Looked at a couple implications in terms of, um, you know, what, what that implies. Wow, good sentence. For, you know, exercise choice, for training, for research, is if failure is occurring in a complex movement, especially a compound movement, at the sticking point, what's actually failing? And this is something I'm going to come back to today. So as promised, I want to start with similar concept um, called the repetition maximum, or the RM. Now, a lot of people use RM and muscular failure synonymously, and this isn't strictly correct. They're not interchangeable, but they're so similar as to it be almost an irrelevant distinction, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So by definition, Actual concentric momentary muscular failure, or just muscular failure, occurs when you fail to complete the repetition or fail to complete the task, right? The weight room, for the time being, let's assume that that means completing a full repetition. Start the rep of the barbell curl, you're able to curl to the top. When you reach failure, you're not able to get to the top, okay? The repetition maximum, the RM, refers to the maximum number of repetitions that were actually completed. So here's an example. You're doing barbell curls with 100 pounds. You are able to complete the 12th repetition from bottom to top. You reach muscular failure on repetition 13, unable to complete the repetition. We would say that you failed on repetition 13, but what this would represent, what we would call it is a 12 repetition maximum. That 100 pounds is the weight that you can lift for 12 times, where 13 would be failure. So by definition, the arm will always be one rep less than the failure rep. Let me note, any RM can be defined. One RM is the maximum weight you can lift once, but not twice. A three RM is the maximum weight you can lift three times, but not four times. 10 RM is the maximum weight you can lift 10 times, the failure occurring on the 11th. I think you get the idea. Let me also note, the RM, like failure, and I'm going to come back to this maybe in part, the next part if I get, get there, assumes a maximal effort, right? Yeah. Assumes it's a maximal effort set. If a trainee does one rep and they could have done three, that's not a one repetition maximum because they stopped at one. If someone lifts a weight once, but they could have lifted slightly more weight, failing on repetition two, that's not an RM either. The repetition maximum weight is the maximum weight you can lift for a given number of repetitions where muscular failure would occur on the next repetition. Here's some pedantry. Like I said, it's not uncommon for people to use RM and muscular failure synonymously. Ian, it's not correct, but there's slight logic to it, right? If you did 12 reps and couldn't have gotten the 13th, 12th rep is kind of the failure rep, or rather you might say you did 12 reps to failure. Also, in a practical sense, it doesn't matter that much. Um, we're looking at a one rep difference. Let me note that that calling something a 12 RM presumes that you wouldn't have gotten the 13th repetition, right? Implicit in this is that you would have failed on the next rep. But in a literal sense, the arm should always be one rep less than the rep where failure occurs. Fine. As one researcher put it, the difference between the RM and the point of muscular failure is that the RM means that a set is terminated after the final repetition has been completed in good form. Whereas the point of muscular failure means that once the RM has been reached, another repetition is attempted, but not completed. Therefore, the last repetition is the failed repetition. It's just another way of repeating what I've already said. Third, beating the dead horse. Basically, assuming a true rep max load, muscular failure should occur at the rep max plus one. 12 RM load, you should fail 13. I said, this is just pedantry, me getting out of my head. So how do you determine the RM? Because this is a problem. As I said above, the strictest definition is that you perform the maximum number of, of full repetitions and fail on the next one. 
But how do you know that you can only do two, could do 10 reps but not 11? Well, in the strictest sense, the only way you can do it is to actually try the 11th and fail, to take the set to actual muscular failure. This brings up concerns about training to failure all the time, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. So not the topic of this. Again, it's really the only true way to know if you've reached an RM low is to fail on the next rep. Another way, and this is used sometimes in studies or training, is to determine, say, your 10RM early in the cycle or early in the study by actually going to failure. You fail on rep 11, all right, boom, this is my 10RM weight. And then assuming that that's going to stay constant for a while. And it probably will for a little while. Eventually, as you get stronger, that 10RM may not be a 10RM anymore. Let me comment. I know that the tools such as reps in reserve, reps to failure, exist for this reason. Discuss those, probably not even the next part, but in the one after that where I hope to put up some training videos. In the vein of reps in reserves and reps to failure, an earlier definition was the self-determined. RM. This is a case where the trainee assumes that they have reached their RM. That is, they predict that they would reach failure on the next repetition. So they reach 10 and don't think they would get 11. That is a self-determined RM. In the reps in reserve, reps to failure framework, this would represent a value of zero. I have zero more reps in reserve because I'd hit failure on the next one. But the problem comes in with this, and again, I'll talk about this later, is that this presumes that the trainee has the ability to estimate when they truly hit failure. And that is questionable. Again, I'll talk about that later. At a fundamental level, the only true repetition max maximum is a true repetition maximum, right? It's like predicting that, oh, based on my five rep weight, I could do this for one rep. Sorry, until you do it for one rep, you haven't done it for one rep. The estimates don't matter. And the only true RM is a true RM is when you actually attempt the next repetition and hit failure. So if you're highly trained, you, you might have a pretty good idea. A good coach who's watching can probably tell based on your technique, bar speed, things I'll talk about. But if you're training by yourself and are not very skilled, only way to know that you've hit a true RM load is to attempt the next repetition and fail. And with all that out of the way, let's start looking at some of the different ways failure has been defined because these different definitions and which one is being used, as I mentioned in the previous part, matters. Two people using two different definitions of failure are having two different conversations, and you cannot compare their training or studies that use different definitions. So like I said, saying training to failure doesn't mean anything because different definitions have been used over the years, and they are not identical. Um, a good historical look at this, if you're a nerd, it's a paper titled Clarity and Reporting Terminology of Set Endpoints in Resistance Training by James Steele et al. Um, I'll provide a link in the video and in the article. Uh, it provides suggestions for more consistent set of definitions, and it's an older paper, which is why some of these have been sort of supplanted. Um, you can see it in the image in the video or on the article. But let's start looking at different definitions, right? First is physiological muscular failure. I really talked about this in part one and two. This is strictly speaking a place where the muscle's force output can no longer meet the force requirement of the activity, right? Riding a bike, can't generate enough force, can't maintain the speed or the wattage or whatever. Part two, talk about that in part one. And part two, talk about in the weight room, and this generally means inability to lift the weight through the sticking point. Um, we might better define this as being unable to lift a weight through a full range of motion, and that's reasonably easy to define, right? We know what a full range of motion is in a bicep curl, right? You can't go from full extension with your arms straight to full flexion with your elbows bent as far as they can be bent. You've reached muscular failure. The squat, we would define failure as the ability to get from the lowest position that you go, whatever that is, to full lockout at the top with your knees locked. No, I'm not. Don't spare me the comments. You should lock your knees. I'm just making definitions. Same on a bench press. From chest to arms locked. That is full range of motion. Leg press. From knees bent to knees locked. Right? You pull down a rowing movement. It's a little bit hazier. Usually you would define it as you know bringing the bar to the chest or the, the row panel to the stomach. Doesn't always get there for a number of reasons. 
not having to do with lat failure, but I don't want to, but you know, we know what full, full range of motion generally means. And if someone can't finish it, if they're on a bench press and get stuck in the middle, fine, they've reached failure. So that's pretty clear and easy, but it, it leaves out nuance. Because again, the weight room is way more complicated than everything else. Because we ask the question, does form matter? If we just use that general definition, well, does anything go, right? If a guy lifts his hips off the bench to get that final rep or starts bouncing it off his sternum, do we accept that? I mean, if so, great. Uh, lean all the way back on the bicep curl to get the rep, cool. Use a tiny body, you know, body English to throw the row handle so you get it to your stomach. Cool. If we're not, if we're not qualifying that just general definition of failure, everything goes. Dumbbell laterals, you lift the weights, duck under it, right? You've technically gotten the weights above your shoulder. It's full repetition, right? Clearly, that's not very useful. If the point of all of this, this has a point. The goal of training is to stimulate the target muscle, right? And part of the whole issue of failure gets into the effective reps framework and why this matters, how we define it. So as I'll finally get to, how you define failure will very much impact on how close you get to full muscular recruitment and sending a stimulating load in the target muscle. Allowing people to do any form, use any form they want, defeats that purpose. Right, as I wrote in that, that muscular tension series, frequently the, the things people do to lift heavier weights by allowing their form to deviate or cheat or whatever actually puts less muscular tension on the target muscle than doing it properly with a lighter weight. The same thing goes in an individual set. If your biceps are failing on a curl and you start leaning back, you may not actually be increasing the stimulus of the biceps. You may be decreasing it because now all the muscles except the target muscle are what's are helping you to get get that keep that bar moving. So like I said, probably the most commonly added qualifier to the definition of failure is it is lifted correctly. One of the earliest definitions by Delorme, look it up guys, was this. The 10 repetition maximum is the most weight that can be lifted correctly through a full arc of motion for 10 repetitions, right? the key being lifted correctly. Most refer to this as form failure, um, which is what I'm going to look at next and actually for the rest of today because this, this I think is where a lot of complications come in. All right, now there are other qualifiers that can be added to the definition of failure and I'll get to those in the next part, hopefully. But the proper form thing is probably one of the most common. Right? You see this repeatedly through the strength training literature in textbooks, research papers. It's used very common in research studies. Right? And, and including this makes sense because it eliminates the whole issue of getting reps by any means possible. Right? There's a video, I was almost going to put it in, and you can go look it up, of Dr. Ken Leisner, who's a big uh, high-intensity training guy who has since unfortunately passed away. If you watch his videos, he believed in doing as many reps no matter what it took. Form broke, things got ugly. I mean, he was all about killing the guy, he had puke buckets. Um, I think that's defeating the purpose. So we're going to use good form. But now we get to make arguments, okay? What constitutes form failure, and can we objectively define it? First, let's look at compound free weight movements, because this is really where the issue comes in, right? They are frequently used, they're used in a majority of studies, and it's where the big problems are going to show up, right? So how do we define form failure on a squat? Well, a lot of things. Uh, cutting depth might be one definition. Certainly lifters do that when they get tired. Um, but at what point do we say, ah, your depth is no longer low enough, and then for the repetition to count, now, now, we're, now the set is over. Right, some studies do describe setting and enforcing depth. I still want to see the videos. Um, There's an Instagram video a, a research group put up. This is last year, and I can't find it right now. And they actually had the lifter squatting to a box, which at least sets it to a standardized depth. So depth might be one, but what about what else? What if the lifter starts to tip forwards out of the hole, shoot their hips? Is that form failure? What if they were already using a form based around hip drive, 
In that case, is form failure actually squatting correctly? Man, I'm funny. Um, do we use a different definition? What if someone starts bolt upright and then starts to tip? How much tip is allowed? Like, I'm being obnoxious about this, but I think you're getting the point. Do we define failure by an inability to keep a hard arch in the upper back or lower back? At what point do we say that rep is form failure and that's where the set ends? At what point do we consider technique to be deviated enough from proper form to call it form failure? What about the bench press? How do we define form failure? Clearly, if you don't complete the rep, but that's not really form failure. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Does it occur when the lift starts to lift their butt up or lift their head up? It's a deteriorating bar path. Bar starts to get wobbly. Lift are starting to bounce the bar off their chest. The study was using a touch and go bench to begin with. When do we decide that it's no longer a touch and go, but a bounce or a heave? Don't even start about studies with a deadlift. Like, good God. The number of places form can go to hell on a deadlift is just enormous. And don't even pretend, researchers, don't even pretend you're taking people to anything approximating failure on the deadlift. Because, bullshit. So, here's one definition. This comes from Brad's original volume paper that sort of kicked off this whole continuing shit show. He wrote, or they wrote, sets consisted of 8 to 12 repetitions carried out to the point of momentary concentric failure, that is, the inability to perform another repetition while maintaining proper form. Now that's fine, at least it's qualifying what failure is, but what does that mean? The only place that I could find in the paper that talked about form was in the, they talked about testing squat and RM and how squat was, they had to break parallel, I think, and bench was defined as five-point contact on the bench press, which I think head, shoulders, butt, uh, feet, probably. It's at least something, but it's not really very clear. Right now, a more recent paper by Aub, Aubi, Obi, A-U-B-E et al. actually did explicitly say they wrote, repetition failure was operationally defined as the inability to complete a repetition or an observable change in technical execution that increases injury risk, e.g. spinal flexion, valgus collapse, meaning the knees break in, asymmetry, presume a hip shift, and some sort of imbalance, I guess getting wobbly. Um, so again, at least this is defined. Still make a judgment call, so those knees, knees break in a little bit, how much is too much? Again, I'm being me, but I'm just trying to make a point that when you use form failure, it needs to be clearly defined. But this brings up the next issue, and one that I've just been like really beating the dead horse on. It's like, what muscle is failing in a compound movement? Louis Simmons once wrote something to the effect of that movements don't fail muscles to. And his point was that when you miss a lift, the miss was ultimately determined by the muscle that was unable to generate sufficient force to meet the requirements of that movement. Right? It's just the old, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link idea, right? So say every muscle in your body, your quads, your glutes, your hamstrings, your upper back could squat 600 pounds, but your low back can only handle 500. Your max squat will be 500, right? Because you're limited by the limiting muscle group. Now, if you bring your low back strength up to where it can handle 650 pounds, now you can still only squat 600 because of all the other muscles that are limiting. And West Side was based around rotating assistance movements to bring up weak points, so everything came up hopefully at once. This brings up the critical issue in terms of actual muscular failure, how we track training volume, and how we talk about or even address growth. Say someone squats, does squats to form failure. Whether you've defined failure operationally or not, we always have to ask what failed. What muscle was unable to meet force requirements to allow the completion of the lift? If we use low back rounding as a criteria, well, if your low back is weak, what does that tell us about the quads or the glutes in terms of the stimulus they have received? It doesn't tell us anything. This might even vary by the individual. People with long femurs who are bent over, their low back tends to give out earlier than people that can squat bolt upright. If they both squat to form failure, can we say anything about the relative training load their quads got? No, we can't. Even if low back is limiting in both. Low back will be limiting later in the upright squatter than in the, the bent over squatter. This matters. 
because if someone's low back is limiting, it may hit failure many repetitions before the quads are close to actual physiological failure, right? So say your quads, we just know this by magic, could squat 200 pounds to 14 reps with the 15th being failure. Let's say the low back is limited. It fails 200 pounds at 10 reps. Well, that set is going to be 10 reps to form failure when the low back gives out, but your quads are still four reps from failure. Counting that as a set to failure is only correct for the low back. The quads are nowhere close, right? In the that effective reps framework, the low back probably got four to five effective reps. It went to failure. The quads maybe got one. Maybe that's why some of these studies seem to find that they need triple the volume of others. This brings up an additional issue, which is technical competency in compound movements. Because again, this matters. We'd never do this, but let's say that for the sake of example, I was training a beginner on squats to failure, form failure. If you've ever trained a beginner, or remember training as a beginner, you know that the technique is going to break long before the muscles are fatigued. You can't even argue with that. Did their quads even get a stimulus? No, because form broke way too early. Yes, this is a stupid example. It's an extreme example to make a point. It's to make the point that form failure and physiological muscular failure in the target muscles can be completely different things. And as people become more well-trained, presumably their technique gets more stable. Presumably, they're likely to get closer to actual physiological muscular failure in the target muscles. So it's a silly example. But here's the thing. I've been in gyms since I was about 15. 35 years, because I'm old. I've been doing this professionally for at least 25. I, I watch people in the gym. Can't help it. In those 25 years, the number of highly skilled, technically skilled squatters I've seen. I could probably count on like four hands, maybe a little bit more. And I probably trained two hands worth of those. And, you, and yes, it's changed with CrossFit, with things have changed, but go into any gym and watch 20 squatters. If you see one or two that are doing it well, somebody will go, I train at a powerlifting gym. I train at an Olympic lifting gym. Get fucked. You know what I'm talking about. Go to the average commercial gym. Tell me what percentage of people squat well, squat technically well, right? And I don't give a shit if they've been squatting for 20 years. They can still have terrible form because I've seen it and you've seen it too. Training age doesn't say anything about technical ability. I had a trainee years ago. He'd lifted for 20 years. I'd start him from scratch technically because he'd been doing everything wrong for 20 years. Technically, he was a beginner, right? Even if, and because of that, the number of trainees I've seen squat that can get anywhere close to what their quads might be able to do is minimal. Do they exist? Sure. I used to do it. Wish I had some video, but this was before cameras. People that squat real upright can do it with years of training. But nobody is going to convince me that some average group of college students or gym jocks pulled into these studies has that skill. Statistically speaking, they don't, because I've watched them and you've watched them. Now, any researchers listening to this are happy to take a video of the workout and prove me wrong, because I'd be happy to be wrong, and if I am, I'll admit it. But take video, show me what this failure in the bench press and the squats look like, so that we can have some indication of how close they actually got to muscular failure, or if their technique just gave out, or as I'll talk about later, they just gave up. Your phone has a camera and everyone is on Instagram. Stop making excuses, right? Someone asked Brad why he didn't video work. I said, we'd have to get someone to review it. Don't you have to review it? Put it on Instagram. Y'all want to shut me up? Then shut me up, because it's time to put up or shut up yourselves. Show me the video. Prove me wrong. Show me that someone your average college student with four years of training is squatting eight sets, sorry, five sets of eight to 12 to form failure on squat on 90 seconds, and things aren't falling apart by set two. Show me this bullshit Brigado study where he claimed eight sets of 10 RM to form failure in the squat on 60 seconds. Bullshit. Show me the fucking video or just admit I'm right.
Now this has consequences of using form failure and compound movements. Because unless someone is super well trained and spent years doing it, form failure and physiological muscular failure is likely to be very different in the sense of muscular force being below force requirements. And only the latter part matters, at least in the target muscles, right? And again, fine, if your low back gives out on squats and that's where you hit form failure, but if, so what? If my goal is to train your quads, if a study is measuring the quads, who gives a fuck that the low back gave out? The low back may have gotten a training stimulus, thrown ultrasound on the low back, spinal erectors, measuring the quads, because we don't know. We don't know. Maybe it did get close, maybe it didn't. Depends on the individual trainee, relative strengths and weaknesses. I'm not saying that it does or it doesn't, I'm saying we don't know. If your low back gives out when your quads had five more sets, five sorry, five more reps in that set, it means that that set to failure was a warm-up for your quads. By did Five reps in reserve, that's not a training stimulus. It's a warm-up set. So of course you need 45 sets per fucking week because every set is useless. Right? Even in compound movements, we get the whole issue of what muscle is working where and things contribute relatively more or less in different positions. So when failure of any sort occurs, do we know what's failing? If the study only measures one muscle and they do for reasons I'm still unclear on, that's not giving us the full picture. You can measure glutes, I've seen it done. You can measure pecs, I've seen it done. Why does nobody do this? I have no idea. If you all bench press, what failed? Pecs, delts, serratus, triceps? If all you measure is triceps, do we know? Do we know how close to physiological failure the triceps were? No, we don't. Again, let's not talk about deadlifts. So best form failure will indicate that a limiting muscle is hitting failure, but that says nothing about the other muscles. If your low back hits failure, throws you off your technique, again, we don't know how close your quads or your glutes were to actual physiological muscular failure. Within the effective reps concept, this matters. Now there's a way around this. Let's talk about form failure on machine or isolation movements. Because here it's a lot less complicated. On a machine, well, not some of those new machines, but on like a hammer chest press, your form is much more controlled and constrained. There is no real form failure to happen other than not making the rep. Yes, fine, people do goofy shit and they squirrel around to get the rep. You know what I'm talking about. Big picture, this is not even comparable to what can go wrong on a bench. Someone is locked into a hammer press. Form failure is going to approximate physiological muscular failure much more closely. They won't be able to get the way through the sticking point. Not because their form failed, because their muscles couldn't generate enough force. Yeah, we still have the issue on compound movements of different muscles firing, you know, in a hammer press. Start off the chest, get stuck in the middle. Do we know exactly what failed? No, but it's still better. Um, we could even take that out. Well, what I, like I said, here, set counting is likely to be much more accurate in that Rather than doing five sets of squats, where maybe the quads were five reps from failure on each, you're doing five sets of leg press to very close to physiological muscular failure, and the quads were actually close to failure. Matters for set counting, because maybe in the first case you do need more sets, because you're so far away from an actual quad training stimulus. But this takes that variable out. It takes out the issue of how stable the technique your subjects are. So like I said, if they're like the trainees I've seen for 25 years, I can say without hesitation that their form is breaking on squats or bench press way before muscular physiological failure. Like I said, some muscle is unable to keep up, but there's zero guarantee it's the one that the single muscle that the researchers um, are using. And of course, all of this goes away with isolation movements because now there's only the one muscle to fail. Isolation to see muscle. So here's a thought to kind of wrap this up. That maybe is an experiment someone should do. Do a volume comparison study with nothing but machine or isolation movements. Studies have used only machines. Usually it's sort of the HIT guys, Steele, Fisher, some of those guys. And, and it's not without precedent. It can be done. You know, I realize that the reason squats and bench presses are included is because they are quote unquote commonly included in weight training programs, and that's fine. But baseline research to look at physiology doesn't always have to be ecological, by which I mean 
completely consistent with real work practice. And I got news for you. A lot of good bodybuilders train mostly on machines. And there's a reason for that. They know that it lets them hit the target muscle better without form failing. It's fun. Again, if you use compound machine movements, ignoring the squirreling around bit, like I said, form failure will mostly be inability to complete the rep, which will be actual physiological muscular failure. There's no par path to deviate. You either make the rep or you don't. Said compound movement, still have the multiple. So let's do let's let's do nothing but isolation work. Someone just do a silly study where they just do nothing but single joint isolation movements for individual muscles. Do a pec deck for chest, a reverse pec deck for back or bent or rear shrug or shrug backs. Do you know lateral raises, bicep curl, tricep? Because if someone did eight sets of ten RM on a pec deck with a two minute rest interval, those sets are going to be too pec physiological muscular failure because there's no form to break. If you actually measured pec growth, that might actually fucking tell us something about volume. If you then only did triceps pushdowns, the only tricep exercise, and measure triceps growth, that would tell us something about triceps volume. Rather, it would tell us a hell of a lot more than doing a ton of sets of barbell bench press to form failure, where you don't even know what failed, and then measuring the triceps. Just a thought. I mean, what do I know? I don't even do science, right, guys? And yet, somehow, I seem to be able to come up with designs that would solve a lot of problems. Maybe I should do science. Maybe y'all should stop being butthurt and listen to me. All right. I'm not done with this series. That was just form failure, which I think has the biggest issues. It'll speed up a little bit. So, next time, continue looking at this topic. Hopefully, finish looking at the definitions of muscular failure and how they impact on practice and research. And then the part after that, video demonstrations to make my real point.